My name's Ian Mile. Um, I work for a company called OpenBit. Um, has anyone heard of OpenBit? Oh, a few. A few. We don't usually do events like this, so this is kind of the first thing I've done like this. Um, and I feel a bit of a fraud for reasons I'll go into later because I don't. We're very much a dinosaur kind of company. We're over 15 years old. And um, we primarily program in a language called Tickle. <laughs> yeah, as I say, we're a 15 year old company. Um, we do the online uh, gambling systems, the back end server side systems for um, companies like William Hill, Labrooks, Paddy Power. Um, the vast majority of European. In fact, I think world betting transaction, at least sports betting, goes through our systems. Um, we do sports. Our, our, our sort of central focus is sports betting, which is actually quite a hard problem to solve. Um, but we also do casino systems, which are more commoditized and relatively simple. Um, we do payments processing. Uh, and obviously, there's a lot of messaging that goes on because we have 300 different applications, all of which talk to each other in different languages and talk to different third parties. Um, on our busiest day of the year, just to give you an idea of the scale of what we do, um, on our busiest day of the year, uh, Grand National this year, we took 43 million movements of money um, on our systems. Um, I had a later, the, the slides that will be put up later um, have more stats on this. Um, let's see if I can remember them. Um, in our biggest second, we took over 8,000 movements of money across our systems. Um, and to give you an idea of that, the scale of that, um, the FTSE will do half a million trades a day. Um, Amazon will at peak do 430 odd, sell 430 things. Um, but that's all, that's quite easy because all you're doing is just adding a number uh, in a bit of memory that eventually gets written out um, in a buffered log to a, to a logical log. Um, the hard bit is the sports betting bit because uh, when you place a sports bet, if it's a multiple, um, you could bring down the bookie because any multiple bet could affect any liability on any other bet on the system, any other outcome on the system. And that's where it gets really complicated. So you've got traders who are worried that someone's going to place a 10-way multiple and the seventh horse is going to come in. And then suddenly they're looking at paying out 2 million quid or telling a customer that they're not going to pay them out the money because there's some small print that says, we can only pay you out this much, um, which they don't like. So that, that's the difficult bit. <clears throat> and we do all this with Tickle. Um, <laughs> so uh, let me tell you a bit about myself, because um, it sort of informs the discussion. Actually, by show of hands, how many people here would describe themselves as devs, devs who've moved into DevOps? Actually, first of all, how many people are DevOps? Oh, not all of you. Not even, oh. That is a surprise. OK. How many people would describe themselves as starting out as devs? Uh, thank you. And how many people would describe themselves as starting out as ops and moving into DevOps? OK, that's fairly even. What are the rest of you, then? <laughs> <laughs> Just here for the pizza and beer. Well, I, I'm stopping that happening. Um, so I was very late to the IT game. I, I did a degree in history, and then I taught abroad for a year, and I tried to be a journalist. Uh, I hated journalism. Um, so I, at 25, I decided to start again, and, and I always liked computers, so I became a developer, uh, did a year's master's conversion course, was a tech lead. We have shared dev servers, you know, big machines we bought so that everyone could develop on them. Um, each customer of ours has a different deployment policy, so we have, at one extreme, we have um, certain UK bookmakers who are quite gung-ho, um, and at the other extreme, we have Canadian government organizations who I've never actually got onto their live system. Each customer's system uh, and deployment policy varies a lot. Um, we flirted with VMs. Um, not only does my laptop not work on the display, it, it doesn't work with VMs. Um, uh, so, uh, but I mean, more to the point, uh, people have always, have always put up VMs as, you know, VMs are the solution, we should just use those, but actually you end up with 10 gig images, you're carting around, you don't know how it got into that state. Um, it doesn't really work. Um, and we have, in the end, we have very complex deployments. We have wiki pages that tell you how to build stuff. We have several wiki pages telling you how to build MySQL. Um, it's, very, it's very frustrating. Um, 
And we have a bespoke build tool, which is actually pretty good, I have to say. Uh, very simple to learn and, and, and easy to use. So when Docker came along, um, I saw it as a huge opportunity because I always wanted what VMs offered. Um, and this was a way to do it easily. But more to the point, I could capture all that complexity and automate it. <clears throat> so I looked at Docker files. How many people here have actually used Docker files in anger? Okay, uh, it's about 20 of you. How many of you have used it for a build of more than 50 steps? Two hands. And how, how honestly do you find it? Okay, okay. <laughs> um, so, I got frustrated very early. In fact, my first experience with a Docker file um, was when I got off the web, ran it. There was a problem with uh, going to the network and downloading an apt file, because my network was shonky at the time. I was on the tube, I think. And it cached an image. That, where was I? Docker files. Yes, uh, I ended up with a, a cached image. I didn't really understand how Docker worked at the time, so I ended up with a cached image that was wrong. And the build kept breaking. I was running it again and again. I got fed up with this. I went onto the Docker thread and I said, I'm having this problem. I'm an idiot. I'm a newbie. Please, please indulge me. Um, and eventually I figured it out. But then I got to a point where I was like, well, I need to actually take in a password which needs to be configurable. No, you're doing it wrong, Solomon says. It's, it's not right. You're, you're, it's just wrong. You're, you're doing it wrong. You need to change the way your company works so that, so that <laughs> <laughs> you can use Docker files which you know, are the way to do things. And I, I agree with the principle. But you know, I live in the real world, and I'm trying to save my company money, and and quickly. So I thought, well, I've got I've got a few options here. Um, I can learn Chef, um, Puppet, Ansible. Um, I've no idea which one's the best. I've never used any of them. Um, this is what I say about being embarrassed and ignorant. Um, I tried learning Chef because I kind of heard that that was the best thing. Uh, so I, I went and read up on Chef, and then I watched several videos um, from Ops Code and lost the will to live, frankly. <laughs> um, and, you know, there's nothing wrong. I, I, Chef's obviously used by a lot of people, and it, it works. It's fine. Um, but I, I asked a friend who left OpenBet, uh, what do you think of Chef? And he said, it's great. Um, it's the least worst tool out there. Um, it works 100% of the time, 60% of the time. And what, what he found uh, frustrating was that, um, and this all, all tied together, because I had an uneasy feeling about Chef, I had an uneasy feeling about Puppet. I read the Puppet book, it looked fine, but I, you know, by that point I'd already written Shut It. Um, I don't want to declare, it's, it's, Simon touched on this earlier, but I don't want to make statements about systems and then let someone else sort it all out for me. I'm a programmer. I have the steps to build this thing. Can't I just tell someone what the steps are and then it kind of does it for me? Um, and Docker makes this possible because you, you don't have to manage state anymore. You should be building stateless, immutable things and then replacing them regularly, as Simon was saying. A lot of what he was saying uh, rang true with me. Um, and also, yeah, we, ha we had a chef enthusiast um, and he produced something which wasn't actually that useful to us. Um, although he's a very smart guy, extremely smart guy. Uh, and then I showed him shut it and he switched to that almost immediately. So that was, that was very uh, gratifying. So shut it is the, the tool I, I built. I went through a four month process with our legal team to get the permission to open source it. Um, but it is open source now. Um, the most promising one as an aside was Ansible. But I kind of lost faith in Ansible when I saw that Ansible scripts then, you, you had like bits of bash embedded in them. And I just thought, well, I just want to write Bash, you know. Um, so I hoped to, I hoped to show you a, a demo of, of um, uh, winning at sorry, winning at two hundred four eight, um, but I can't because uh, the, the the demo doesn't work. But you'll see on the slides there's a um, there's a, a link to my uh, videos where I do that. Now I can show you shut it in action. Somewhere. Hang on. <laughs> I don't use Max. What the hell is going on? There we go. Okay. 
So this should right. Okay, so this is a GUI that uh, it's essentially a command line tool. I'm a command line guy, but uh, Aiden is Aiden here? Oh, Aiden, hello. <laughs> Aiden wrote this front end, um, and what it essentially gives you is is a view on um, the build you want to make. And over here we have a load of modules. Um, these are the standard library modules, uh, which are just part of um, the Git repo. <coughs> so we've got a Postgres one, we've got a MySQL one, we've got a sh we've got a Docker one somewhere, um, an Xlib dev, and so on. Now, if I want to build, for example, a VNC container, uh, sorry, if I want to build a Win2048 container, which I've blogged about elsewhere, um, I click on 2048, and it's uh, evaluated the dependency on VNC, because in order to play uh, 2048, you need to uh, have VNC. Um, then if I want to set the config, <coughs> Each module has a has one or zero or more configs. So VNC here has a config. Win 2048 has no configuration. So now I can. Can you see that? Okay, by the way, or is that? Yep. Uh, VNC. So you can change the the password for VNC there if you want. So I'm gonna change it to my pass. And then let's kick off the build. And off it goes. It's running. These are the commands it runs as it goes. So you can see at the top there, it's trying to figure out what sort of uh, distro I'm on. Um, you just give it commands like uh, install, install password, install sudo, and it goes and figures out the, the distro. Although, actually, the distribution doesn't really matter, as, as the previous speaker said. Um, everyone's obsessed with, can you do this on CentOS? And it's like, well, yeah, it's easy, but do you really need to for development purposes? Um, and on the right here, you've got the the server server logging. Um, how are we for time? Okay, I think we're coming to the end of time. Um, so, had had a good piece of news today in that a guy who used to work for OpenBet, who I gave this thing to, who uses Chef, uh, I said, "Have you looked at Shutter yet?" And he said, "Well, no, sorry, uh, but I gave it to a, one of my staff, and he wants to use it in production, so uh, to build." machines for production. So um, it's very exciting. I mean, even if, even if the only output of this for us at OpenBet is that we get a consistent series of steps um, for building a, our development systems, that will have been worth it. But I hope for much more for this. Um, check out the slides later, because there's a lot more information on them than were in the original ones I sent. Grab me if you have any questions. OK? Thank you. Cool, thank you.